Good morning everyone and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. We've got a full house today, no apologies have been received and we also welcome John Scott MSP uh, for agenda item one which we'll move to shortly. Who I know has got a strong constituency interest in this area so thank you John for, for, for coming along, that's, that's welcome. So we now move to agenda item one which is building regulations in Scotland and the committee will take evidence on Building Regulations Scotland from, and can I welcome Nicola Barclay, Chief Executive Homes for Scotland, Malcolm McLeod, Director, NHBC Scotland, Stephen Kent, President, Scottish Building Federation, Dave Aiken, Scottish uh, Local Authority Building Standards Scotland, and Jim Gilmore, Board Member, Federation of Master Builders Scotland. Thank all of you for coming along this morning. Given the, the, the size of the, the, the panel of witnesses this morning, we're going to move straight to questions. Hope that's okay with everyone. And for our first question, can I ask Graham Simpson? Thanks, convener. Um, I'm going to start um, with uh, you, Mr. Aiken, as you uh, represent the uh, local authority uh, building control sector. Um, and I wonder if we can just set the scene um, for the committee members and, and people watching, if we can just describe the actual system as it exists. If I can uh, read from um, a document uh, which your organisation produced, uh, called Verification During Construction Non-Domestic Buildings. Um, and I'm quoting direct, Verification of the compliance of building works with Scottish building regulations is undertaken by the 32 Scottish local authorities in their role as verifiers, and you've all been uh, uh, reissued with those licences recently, I, I believe. Um, the work of verifiers has two main elements checking that building plans comply with building regulations when an application is made for a building warrant and undertaking reasonable inquiries to verify that the building work complies with the approved plans, details and with regulations. And before I move on, perhaps you can describe what reasonable inquiries means. Okay, I can do that. Um, I think it's important to, to stress the difference between... Um, Labs also makes reference to the the, uh, the system in England, and there's differences there. I think it's important to, that the committee are aware of that and the differences. Very much in Scotland's a preemptive system, where plans are checked to ensure compliance with the building standards, uh, and then the, the builder can be, uh, start the build. In terms of the reasonable inquiry that that, that goes on on site, uh, look, all local authorities issue a, a compliance plan or a CCNP, as it's commonly known. This is a tailored uh, inspection plan to, uh, against the, uh, the actual risk associated with that uh, particular build. So it's, it's risk assessed uh, and it allows local authorities to, to um, focus their attention on higher risk projects um, with the resources that they have available. Um, so in terms of reasonable inquiry, uh, the C within the CCNP, as I said, there's targeted inspections on higher risk elements of the build. Uh, such as um, it will go through uh, drainage, it will look at f uh, fire issues, look at structure, and it all depends on, on the, the, the risk, the associated risk with that building type. Um, so these plans are um, constructed in such a way. Okay, so on a, let's say, a large um, housing development, uh, a council would be sitting down in, the, in an office uh, and making uh, some kind of judgment uh, on which plots to, to have a look at. You wouldn't be looking at every plot. Well, what, what would happen in a, a, a large volume house build site, uh, the verifiers would um, do, the, the, first of all, they would liaise with a, the with a developer uh, at the time the building warrant's approved, because they would need to know, importantly, when the, when the site's going uh, to start, and then that way they could, they could get a feel of, of the, the, the phase, the way the, the, the the build's going to be phased. Um, at one time, um, developers were, you know, building maybe 20, 20 houses at one time. That's not the case now. The landscapes changed quite a, quite a bit. Um, so importantly, uh, local authority verifiers have to engage at an early stage with the developer, just to get an idea of how the the build program, how how it looks. That way, then the the uh, the, the verifier can produce a CCNP. Uh, associated to that site, and that will that will include um, random in, inspections. 
So it could be a, a, a one in four ratio, depending on the numbers and, and the, the, the size of the, the, the site. So, so there'll be random sampling done. And again, it's all, all risk-based. So the, the short answer was uh, no, you don't look at every site. There'll be an inspection, there will be an inspection done on every site, a completion inspection. Let me uh, move on to the, uh, the next quote from the same document. The inspection of building work in progress is an important part of the building standards verification procedure. However, it must be stressed that inspections are to protect the public interest in terms of compliance with building regulations, not to ensure that all the work is constructed as the person paying for the work would want it. How do you explain that? Yeah, I think if uh, refer to the one of the, um, the the documents referred to in our paper, the Optimal Economics Report 2014, it highlighted uh, differences in the purpose of uh, what are classed as warranty inspections and inspections carried out by a verifier. Uh, warranty inspections are undertaken to ensure the construction conforms to, co to to guidance and standards primarily carried out on behalf of clients to protect their private interest and minimise the risk of claims, whereas inspections carried out by verifiers focus on the public interest, issues such as carbon and energy reduction. Right, so if we can cut through all that, yeah. um, what basically happens is a council does a paper exercise, assesses risk, then doesn't go out and inspect every stage of every property. So when it comes to actually buying a new house, the person buying the house can have no confidence that that house has been built to standard. Well, they would seek confidence from the, the legal system, as it's set out just now. The responsibility lies, clearly the, the responsibility lies with the, the developer who signs off the, the completion certificate to say that all the, the build has been carried out in accordance with the building regulations. That's an important part. That's the way the current system set up in Scotland. So, so you're, you're saying it's the responsibility of the developer. What's the point of your service? Well, as I said earlier, the, the important point to make is a preemptive <coughs> system. So we ensure compliance with the plans, and the builder builds off the approved plans. Okay, but you're not actually ensuring compliance with everything, anything, because you're not inspecting every stage. Um, so a house buyer cannot have that confidence. Now we've heard evidence earlier. Um, in private, um, I won't give the details because it was in private, but we've uh, heard evidence uh, of cases uh, across Scotland where um, people have bought homes that have uh, ended up being defective because problems were not picked up. And, 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 and in one case, mm -hmm. it was a lot of houses mm -hmm. not picked up through the building control system. Don't you think there's something missing there? It's lax. Well, as I say, the, the main um, responsibility lies with the developer as they sign off the, the completion certificate to say that the build has been carried out in accordance with approved plans, which has been uh, stamped by the local authority. Well, what's that completion certificate meant to prove? It's meant to prove that the, the, the developer has carried out the build as per the approved plans that were signed off by the local authority. And clearly, the, what you've uh, put forward, that's not happened. Uh, yeah, so, the, so the developer has falsely signed the, the declaration on the completion certificate. So it's the developer's fault and it's uh, not down to you to check anything that the developer's telling no, you? No, that, that we, we'd carry a reasonable inquiry. Um. Okay. Can I uh, quote you um, from the inquiry into the uh, Edinburgh schools? You'll, you'll recall that. Um, so two paragraphs 10.6.3 the inquiry formed the view that there was a common misconception even among some council officers as to the extent of the reliance that can be placed on the quality of construction of a building that has gone through the statutory building standards process that's pretty damning isn't it I think uh, in terms of that that report you referred to, I think local authority building standards came out um, actually quite well. I don't think they were damned at all, uh, in fairness. 
I think what it did highlight the core report is that there are weaknesses in the in the in the system, the entire system. I think when you look at building standards, you have to look at building standards holistically. And every stakeholder involved in the construction process has a part to play in ensuring compliance with building standards. I'll read you another paragraph, 10.6.10. Uh, from the above, it is evident that the building standards system is not designed or intended to give the level of assurance that a client may require in relation to the more detailed aspects of the construction of a building. Um, and anyone can jump in on this, if you wish. We start to draw a distinction between the role of local authority verifiers and the wider construction process from private developers. So we will want to tease out some more of that. So if anyone else wants to come in, that would be good. But I'd also point out that Elaine Smith and Jenny Gorith want, want to come in for some supplementaries on, on, the, on this as well. Graham, so does anyone want, want to come in on what they've heard so far, Mr McLeod? Thank you, Convener. I think just to, to maybe record that... Um, you know, I think the points that have been made by, by Mr. Simpson have, have been well documented in the past, and even as back as um, back in 2009, the Scottish Government published consultation titled, entitled uh, "Improving Compliance with Building Regulations," and that recorded the fact that um, it's highly improbable that the work on site would comply with what was being proposed in the design because of the the lack of follow-up inspection. So this isn't a, a new issue or a new problem. And the school's report has certainly seemed to have followed the same line and reinforced the position that was stated back in 2009. Is that a problem with NHBC covered properties as well, Mr McLeod? No, I wouldn't say so, no. I mean, our, our systems are significantly different to those employed by local government in Scotland. It, it's worth putting on the record that some of the information we, we received in private from constituents believe that developers NHBC have let them down badly as well. I think, think that's worth pointing out at this stage. Does anyone else want, want to come in? No takers in, in relation to that. <coughs> uh, Graham, do you want to follow up on anything before I bring in some fellow members? Um, I'll just make a final point because I know um, other questions will, will flow from this. Um, so if, if um, and we've, we've, we've heard evidence that you know, many, many households or householders have faced problems with uh, with buildings because it's not just houses I've mentioned schools as well could be any buildings um, my understanding and perhaps uh, mr. Aiken you could confirm this that if uh, uh, if there are defects uh, established uh, later on there's actually no mechanism within the building Scotland Act to rescind a completion cert certificate that, that would be correct yeah yeah that's right there's no form of redress it becomes a civil matter between the, the, the purchaser and the, and the builder. Fine. Okay, that, we might return to that at some point, okay. Mr Aiken, I suspect. Elaine Smith. Thanks, convener. Um, can I ask, Mr Aiken, has the, over the years you said that things have changed somewhat and that there might have been at one point 20 houses being built by a developer, but now presumably we're talking 200 more than, rather than 20. Has there been a reduction in building control officers employed by local authorities over that period? Uh, I, I don't have these, these figures available. Um, I, could, I couldn't tell you. I know that within the building standard system uh, just now, there's, there's 500 employees roughly, and we have about 250 charter surveyors within that. A bit. spread across the whole of Scotland, but I couldn't tell you the, the actual numbers, um, you know, by per, per local authority. Right, well, would charter surveyors be different to building control officers? Yeah, well, there's different different levels. You can have a building inspector, you can have a technician, and a charter surveyor um, obviously would deal with higher risk issues. Right, so, I mean, I suppose the, the, the question then would be that people perhaps assume that because there is building control certificates of completion issued, then that gives confidence. But what you are saying is that the the only redress and recourse is legally between the buyer and the the, the company they're buying off. So it's basically buyer beware, as, as my colleague pointed out earlier. Yeah, that would be correct, yeah. Okay, okay thank you for that. Jenny Gorith. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, 
Mr Aitken, if I could just go back to you and, and drill down a wee bit on uh, some of the issues that um, my colleague has highlighted. Um, you say that the developer has the final sign-off, but the local authority has the right to reasonable inquiry. Yes. Um, the local authority has a right to inspect the work in progress to check the warrant is being complied with. So I just want to know if, if there is consistency nationally in terms of how that's being applied. Or do you have information on that? Do you have any data to say that it's being applied nationally in a consistent fashion or is that information well, not available? Well, uh, what's actually happening on the ground, I don't have the, the actual the stats, but in terms of uh, driving consistency nationally, the verification during construction handbook, each verifier, each local authority will, will use that, that, that guidance as laid out. Um, and, and as I said before, each building warrant, every individual building warrant will receive its individual uh, com um, CCNP compliance plan, which will identify on a risk basis the, uh, the types of inspections, the number of inspections that will be carried out. But I suppose what my question is that whilst the local authority has that right to inspect the work, there is nothing to compel them to do so. Well, reason, reasonable inquiry compels them to do so. So they have to, they have to carry out a form of reasonable inquiry. That's the, the legal term. How would we kind of term reasonable inquiry then? What would lead them to that if they're kind of, if somebody comes to them with a complaint or is, is that how it usually works? Or it's not done basically as a matter of course. It's when an issue arises that they would come in and carry out some sort of check. Is that right? No, no, the, the checks would be laid out uh, within the, the CCNP. Right, OK. OK, so the inspections are laid out within that. But they don't have to do it? Yes, they do. They do have to that's, do it. That, well, that, that would be reasonable inquiry. OK. okay. Can I just follow up a little bit on, on the reasonable inquiry? I, I, I assume developers are like... MSPs, you get good, bad, and indifferent ones, I suspect, right? Yeah. So yeah, would, 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 would part of that reasonable inquiry be looking to see the track record of different construction companies and developers <coughs> over the years to see about the level of complaints there's been post-construction, for example? What, so it would be quite helpful for the committee to get an idea of what a reasonable inquiry would mean. And, and just before you answer that, Mr Aiken, I should point out we are going to move on to look at the checks that are in place for the warranty system. For, for, for private developments, that's something we want we want to explore as well. But how how would you get an evidence base around a risk assessment for the the, the depth of inquiry for each, each development? Maybe a little bit more about that would be quite helpful. Okay, well, uh, the, the the document referred to the verification during construction handbook identifies the the the, uh, the the quality of the builder, if you like, in past experiences. That will be factored in to the the CCNP the the risk assessment. So if, if there's a known builder that have had problems with before, the CCNP would be cranked up, the risk would be cranked up. Okay. Um, it might be helpful to hear from some of the representatives of, of the industry in relation to the checks and balances that they believe are in place in relation to that construction process itself. That might give us an overview from Mr Aiken about what the role of the local authority verifiers are within that process. And from from what we're hearing, much of that is based on risk assessment, reasonable inquiry, and then a degree of trust with the developers that when they certify something has been completed appropriately, that that's, that that joint sign off or individual sign off, Mr. Aiken? No, the responsibility, the legal system is, is quite clear that it lies with the developer. Okay. So they're signing off the completion certificate. The local authority will either accept or reject that completion certificate. Okay. So how can we have comfort that those completion certificates are, I don't mean this in a glib way, but are worth the paper they're written on? How can we make sure that they are valid? So what checks and balances are there within the system currently? Mr Kemp, I, I'm not always very good at people yeah. catching my eye. Be telegraph yeah, it if you want yeah. to speak, please, Mr Kemp. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I think in talking uh, with a developer hat on from personal experience, and I've, I've operated down here and for a bulk builder and now uh, run the family firm back home in the islands, uh, there was a vast difference in the, the frequency of inspection. And I can, you know, we are very fortunate up in Orkney where we've got a relatively well resourced local authority, relatively low volume of work. And so we do see our inspectors come to the site very regularly. Um, however, speaking to members from all over the country elsewhere, it, that the frequency of the ins inspection can vary very substantially from a local authority area to area, depending on the volume of work and the resource levels in that area. Okay, thank you. That, that's really helpful because Mr Gil Gilmore and Mr McLeod actually put their hands up, which really helped me know they went to speak. <laughs> Mr Gilmore. 
Many thanks. Uh, what, we, what we do down south at the moment, FMB covers the whole UK, and we've got FMB Scotland, etc. But down south, we signed a concordia about 19 months ago with Bilm Control uh, regarding a partnership. And part of our partnership is that we do individual inspections at every contractor within two to three years, every two to three years. And it's an external company of charter surveyors who carry out the inspections of these people. And what does happen is, and I'm a developer and a construction man myself, the scenario being is, as an area of trust, and you build up trust. And the question you were asking earlier was, has someone got a track record of being maybe very disappointing in previous contracts? Then they up the ante on that, and that's the master plan down south, which we were bringing back up here. To, we're only new in a partnership with uh, Bill and Control up here in the last year, and it's, a, it's, it's becoming a bit of a marriage that probably take a couple of years before that really beds in. But I think the individual, they don't like it, but I think the individual inspection that we brought in about four or five years ago has been the best thing for not finding yourself in court uh, from the Federation side to sit and represent the members and also for the clients at the other end. The other one is a lot of these sites that people talk about should have had a clerk of works, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got a full time clerk of works, he is inspecting as the site goes along. The expense of that is not crazy on a development, trust me. And I'll give you a tradesman's view. The last bit I'll do. If you have got a decent clerk of works on site, that clerk of works will build up a relationship with the joiner, the electrician, the plumber. He sets the standard when he's on site. He turns around and goes, sorry, if you fit a window like that again, I'll be going to your contractor, your, your employer, sorry, and you won't be on this site. So that process, and I think it's all about the checks and balances what we're get, trying to get to. Can I just check for clarity? Absolutely. That's really helpful. Who employs the clerk of works? Well, in a local authority site, it would more than likely be a local authority clerk of works that would be on the site. On a private site, it's up to the contractor to employ a clerk of works, not up to the local authority. Right, and, uh, okay. So, is it specifically on this? Yes. Let's leave because I want Malcolm yeah. McLeod to in a second. Yeah. Like Malcolm. the question you asked. No, Mr. No. Gilmer, on yeah. the clerk of works, mate, it would yeah. be my understanding a number of years ago that every major building company would have had clerks of works, not just one, maybe a yeah. team of them, because they're employing subcontractors. Are you actually saying now that you could, a major building company could be building 400 houses and not have a clerk of works? Well, what they've got is maybe a foreman or a supervisor who's been in the industry for quite a while and maybe educated in it as well. And his, his job is to go around and get that site built. You've got a contracts manager normally on a site, a scaled site, you have a contracts manager, but the structure used to be contracts managers, site agent, general foreman, foreman, charge hands of each trades. That's disappeared. Trust me, that has disappeared. So you're left with, I don't, I've got a personal view and I hope it's, I'm allowed to express it, but my personal view is about project management. There's no a great bond. They go out, in my view, to cost. Some people come in, and I'm just going to use hypothetical sums, some at five million, some at four million, they're going to look at the four million because it's all about profit. I'm sorry to say that. That is what the system always was, was a structured supervision all the way down. And I think that's what's missing. That's a personal view. Okay, uh, Mr McLeod, is there a, a less structured supervision on site now? What would NHPC's view be on that? Um, do, you want to talk, do you want me to talk about NHPC's processes or, well, well, I think, uh, or I, comment I, on what Mr well, Gilmore's? Well, well, I, I think... I think both are inextricably linked, so maybe reflect what Mr Gilmore has said and then see how NHPC can provide a degree of reassurance, hopefully, in relation to that. Well, I think Mr Gilmore's comments are valid, but um, historically that used to be the case, but certainly that changed many years ago, and it's now very unusual to have a clerk of works on any building site. Um, you generally will have clerk of works where you have a housing association or a local authority project, and they tend to be directly employed by either that housing association or local authority. But in the private sector, um, it's exceptionally unusual to have someone fulfilling that role. Uh, in terms of quality control and checking the workmanship, it then tends to be devolved to various people within that particular organisation, be that the site manager on site, who has many other tasks to do, or another individual identified 
um, to carry out that function. Um, so there is that kind of um, potential lack of supervision uh, in terms of quality of construction, which is where NHPC can come in and assist. Uh, and we do that by having a structured inspection process uh, in terms of the quality of construction and looking at that from inception through to completion. Okay, could you say a little bit more about that, Mr McLeod? That might be helpful. Yeah, we, um, I think if we go back even further, we've, NHPC uh, is an insurance company and we have a register of builders. We're not a trade organisation. Now, before you can become registered with NHPC, we also have an assessment process that we go through. So any builder that is registered with NHPC has been checked and vetted in terms of their financial and technical competence. And we also then check whether or not they've had any bad history with us. And if that's the case, then we would not entertain them being on the register. Once we get through that process on site, we carry out a detailed structured inspection process on every single house that we cover. And that will check the foundations when they're excavated. It will check the walls when they're being built. Uh, we check that at middle level for low rise housing to make sure we can check the wall ties and check that the wall construction is correct. We check at head of build for all flats for the same reason. Uh, we check the internal services, plumbing and electric before they're covered up. And then we do a final inspection check once the house is complete. <coughs> on top of that, we also set benchmark inspections uh, in terms of roofing. So for every site that we cover, we will check the first one or two roofs that are built, accept that as a benchmark, and then spot check roof construction as it's proceeding throughout the site. site. Uh, where flats are involved in multi-occupancy, we carry out checks for fire. So we'll check things like uh, the proper fire stops have been installed, the proper fire uh, protection is being uh, provided, uh, and we'll do that as well. Uh, we recently introduced over the last year um, a number of initiatives to assist the industry improve quality. Uh, we have a, what we call a construction quality review that we've rolled out now over the last year to, at the moment, three or four major builders, and we're working to extend that across the UK. Uh, that entails us visiting every single site across the UK the builder is working on, visiting um, and inspecting all areas of work on each site, and producing a very detailed, specific report to that site, which we then accumulate into a larger report for that builder, uh, and we only do that with the buying of their board so that we report that back to their board and identify where they can improve their construction processes. Um, so we're doing quite a lot of work at the moment in terms of trying to uh, work with the industry and also to ensure that at the end of the day a quality product is produced. We might come back and follow up at some point when things sure. go wrong because we can absolutely. have the best system in the world and things <coughs> can still go wrong. Uh, we'll, absolutely. We'll, we'll come back to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fellow committee members want to explore a couple of points in relation to this. So I'm going to Alexander Stewart first, then Elaine Smith, and I've got you, Andy, okay? Thank you, Convener. And thank you for the explanation, Mr. McLeod, of the processes you go through. Uh, but it's obviously quite apparent that there are still faults within the system. Uh, and individuals who find themselves in that situation where there is a defect or there is a fault. Uh, I'd like to ask them a little bit about maybe the the build mark cover that comes within that process. Uh, so if there is a defect found, uh, what would normally be rectified uh, under the cover to ensure that that defect didn't progress to anything more uh, difficult or dangerous uh, from being a small defect? The, the defect, uh, initially the build mark covers for 10 years from the date the house is purchased. And for the first two years after the date of purchase, the build mark cover will cover virtually everything in that home. So if anything fails within the first two years, uh, the homeowner can come back and make a valid claim against that policy. It is an insurance policy. The process that we have internally is that within that first two years, we have to give the builder the opportunity to address that complaint or that defect. If they fail to do that, then NHPC will take over that process and we will then uh, rectify that to the satisfaction of the homeowner. For claims within the first two years, these uh, what we call Section 2 claims, when we investigate these, uh, we carry out an investigation if the builder doesn't attend, we find 75% or thereabouts in favour of the homeowner. For the last eight years of the policy, uh, it's, it's not as defined. It doesn't cover everything in the house. Well, I shouldn't say it's not defined. It is defined. It doesn't cover everything in the house. So it doesn't cover plumbing, electrical wiring, kitchen fitments and central heating systems. But basically everything else is covered. Uh, and if there's a defect within the last eight years, then the homeowner comes to NHPC with us uh, and works with us to try and resolve that. Uh, if it's a serious and major defect, we may 
ask the builder to become involved. Uh, equally, we may not. Uh, we may just progress to try and resolve it. The policy for the last eight years is structured in a way that um, for the defect to be found valid under the terms of the insurance policy, it must be a defect which is a breach of our building standards. We have our own building standards and it must cost more than £1,500 to fix. Uh, and it's been like that for uh, a long, long time. So if it meets that criteria, that's when we would accept it as a valid claim. Now, the backup that the homeowner has is that if the homeowner disagrees with us mm -hmm. at all, we're a regulated company. We're regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulator Regulating Authority. Um, they have the right, and we advise them of this, to refer the matter to the Financial Ombudsman, and they will make a determination of whether we've approached and, uh, and managed the, prop the, the complaint properly or whether we haven't. And uh, the findings and outcome of the Financial Ombudsman uh, you know, is mandatory. We have to then respond to that. We've got, there's no, we, we don't challenge that at all. And, and uh, a defect or a complaint of this nature that you've gone through, how, how long would you expect that to sort of run? Uh, is it months into years? Into they vary. Uh, we do have some that have been going on very long, which isn't, isn't satisfactory. Sometimes that's because of the complexity of the work or trying to find out a solution. It depends on what the problem is, whether you know, trying to get this proper material, um, trying to um, you know, actually identify the root cause of it. Sometimes can be difficult. Uh, the vast majority of them, about 90% of them, are, are small claims that are handled and dealt with within uh, weeks to, to months okay. uh, and resolved. There are about maybe 10% where they are very complicated, large claims that do take a lot longer to resolve and can become protracted over time. And in, in a development, uh, what is your expectation of finding faults or, or, or having individuals come to you uh, to look at the cover that they've got within the first two years? Uh, is that a, a normal procedure? Uh, does it happen regularly or is it infrequent? Well, we have an, on an annual basis around about seven to 8,000 complaints within that time frame uh, annually across the UK. Um, so that's the kind of volume that we tend to see. Um, we don't assess. I mean, the ideal, the ideal situation is that we, 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 you know, the building industry working with us delivers a home to a quality that's very good. And one of the things that we do carry out separately is a, a, a survey, a customer satisfaction survey. Mm -hmm. And over the last few years, that has indicated that levels of satisfaction have been increasing. Uh, and one of the questions we ask them is about the quality of their home <laughs> and who, you know, how satisfied they are. So we do get these complaints. Um, they tend to be static, as I say, around about 78,000 a year. And that's, you know, last year, I think we, NGPC, dealt with about 160,000 houses. So that's the kind of level of complaints within that two-year period compared to the overall volume of business that we're actually doing. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Shrew. Can I just check something, Mr. McLeod? And this is inspired by some of the uh, the constituents who had a briefing with us in private earlier on. Would NHBC have a, a code of conduct or a duty to investigate um, anything that could be a, a systemic issue or structural issue in relation to property. So the example we heard, I'll be very careful with the example, the limited information I'll give from the example we heard, there was issues in relation to the foundations of a small number of properties where the owners were aware of that. Um, now, would NHBC consider that they would have a duty, because they would be involved in investigating that, a duty to go to the other 50, 60, 100, 200 households in that development to say, oh, this could be a problem for everyone else as well. We better have a look at this. Or would they have a duty to inform the local authority that despite the fact the verifier signed off on it and that trusting relationship eh, got that signed off, would they then inform the local authority for them to take some action in relation to that? So where would the NHBC sit in relation to go, because you're sure that there's pay outs here, right? So obviously yeah, yeah. Th there's, there's in theory conflicting tensions there with any insurance company. You know, insurance companies don't seek people out after a flood to say, Can, do you want to make a claim? You know, well, seek, they seek to mitigate the liabilities. So would you seek to mitigate the liabilities of NHBC or would you seek other potential victims of where a systemic error has taken place? Well, it, it's a difficult one to answer very clearly, but the initial um, build map policy is a, a bespoke individual insurance policy. And what we do is we respond to claims or complaints made against that policy <coughs> by the individual policy holders. Now, if, for example, that complaint relates to, say, a communal building, a block of flats, 
then yes, we may very well extend that investigation because we're working common areas like you know roofs or, or foundations or drains or something like that of that nature. Where it's down to an individual property, then we would tend to look at that particular individual property and deal with that complaint because we don't know whether that complaint is systemic or not. But surely the only way you'll find out if it's systemic, Mr McLeod, is to take action. Do you not think there's a professional duty upon NHBC to to go around the rest of the development after it's been signed off to see if this is systemic? Do you not think there's a duty based on the risk assessment that local authorities have to carry out to inform the local authority that there's, there's been issues there so they can manage their inspection regime and verification regime differently for that potential developer next time? So how, how would you reconcile that? Well, what I can say is over the last few years, engagement with uh, with labs particularly has been very difficult in that they haven't really been willing to engage very much with NHBC. But putting that aside, I don't see it's our duty to actually uh, go to local authorities and particularly highlight and point to them where there could be problems, because there might not be problems. Where there are problems, and we have, do have examples of this, we have been work we do work with local authorities where, for example, we have an issue with a, with a foundation and we maybe then have to go back to the building uh, control department and obtain a building warrant, we'll make it clear to them why we're doing that, and we will then work with them, and potentially that may open up that picture in terms of there might be other complaints and other claims come in. Uh, we have had instances where we do go out, I mean, there's a development down in the, in the west uh, coast where we have worked with the builder and insisted that the builder go around the houses and go around the development to fix a particular issue that we, we discovered. Uh, now, the builder's done that. We've, we've actually done that on a number of occasions. If the builder hadn't done it, then the likelihood is, yes, we would have probably stepped in and taken over that role. I mean, that, that all sounds really good examples. However, surely there's a professional duty that if there's a 200-unit development and six property owners emerge with significant problems in the property, there's a duty on NHBC who have this really robust inspection regime as you outlined at length earlier to go, oh, these six got under the radar. What's happened here? Maybe the other 194 could have issues. Well, Surely well, to goodness there's a duty or a prof it's incumbent upon you professionally to look at that and to inform the local authority. Whether it's a statutory duty or not, do you not feel a, a degree of well, uh, duty we, there? What we would do is that we would refer the individual to the local authority if they feel that there's a complaint. We're not, we're not a statutory body, so... We, we would really, if there's an issue that we feel that local authority, building control should be involved in, we would refer to the individual or the group of individuals refer, concerned and advise them to contact. In fact, we'd even probably give them advice on what to do. Uh, in terms of responding to complaints, if uh, it's an individual complaint, that's what we respond to. We, we can't second guess if it's a, a, an issue across the development or not. What we tend to find out happens very quickly in these sort of developments if there are a number of complaints that are of a similar nature. Uh, word of mouth gets out very, very quickly. And what tends to happen is that we then um, are inundated with complaints along that same vein. Now, if we do get a complaint in, we are duty-bound to investigate it under the terms of the insurance policy. So if we get a complaint in, we will investigate it. And where there is a complaint on a building site or a housing development, uh, as I said, word of mouth tends to work very well, and we said we certainly are inundated with a number of complaints from that particular yeah, development. Lots of my colleagues want to, to explore this a bit further. Apologies to some of my colleagues. A long list of you here. We'll start, I think, with Elaine Smith, and then we'll go to Graham Simpson, uh, and but we'll get all of you in, okay? Thanks very much, convener. Can I go back a step, Mr. McLeod, please? Could you tell us um, who, basically, who funds you? What what is your funding body? What is your purpose? We don't have a funding body. Our purpose, our purpose since we were established in 1936 is, is two, core, two core reasons for existing. One is to raise house building standards, which we do through our inspection process, our building standards, uh, working with the industry, the research that we do, and to protect the consumer interest of home buyers. Okay, That's but where do you get all the money to do that? Where do you get your funding from to deliver that? We get the money from the that? investments that are made um, by NHBC. But you can't make company. investments if you don't get funding in, in the first place. I suppose I'll take this back a step. Do you get funding from builders? The builders pay an insurance premium right. um, to NHPC okay. for the 10-year insurance. Uh -huh. uh, NHPC then invests that premium over time, right. and that premium has uh, grown over time and has become so, a significant portfolio. So the companies that are NHBC registered, because there are companies that are not, so the That's ones right. that are NHBC registered, are these the companies that fund you? No, they pay a premium each for okay, each property. 
Right, and so the ones that are not NHBC registered, is that because they don't pay you a premium? That's, a, that's an individual decision. If no, they, I'm not asking about their decision. Is that because they don't pay you a premium? So basically... No, they, they decide if they wish to become registered with NHBC or not, and then we will decide whether or not we wish to have them on the register. Right. There are builders that we decline, there are builders that apply to become registered with NHBC that we will not accept because okay. of uh, certain criteria. Okay, so, so the people, the builders that you inspect, that you have this inspection regime mm. with, are the ones who pay you the premium, correct? They pay an insurance premium, that's correct. Okay. Can I ask how many field officers you have in Scotland? Uh, roughly in Scotland we have about 70 staff, roughly. Is that field officers that go out and do the inspections? We have uh, three teams of inspectors uh, across Scotland. Um, in each team there are about 10 people, led by an inspection manager. So we have about 33 people directly dealing with uh, physical inspection of the construction. Those are the physical inspections? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then you said that, um, particularly foundations, if we go back to foundations, yeah. that's the kind of thing that you would uh, be very clear about inspecting all foundations. That's correct. So if there was then later a problem with foundations, whose fault would that be? Well, it would be, uh, it could be the builder's fault, it could be the designer's fault. But not your fault for no, inspecting we, we, the foundations we, we and not have, we, finding anything wrong? We could have missed it. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm not saying that's not the case. We could have missed it. Um, and the reality is it's a very difficult area to investigate. Um, because you're looking at exposed ground and below that ground there could be something that nobody knows about and a lot of the foundation failures that we deal with um, tend to be related to subsidence because of things like peat which are below the level of clay that looks all right when you're looking at it but suddenly there's a bit of peat there that no one know knows about uh, that causes subsidence. Okay, so I suppose my final question on this is do you see any conflict of interest at all with the fact that the members of NHBC, so they only houses and companies, the only houses that are getting an NHBC 10-year guarantee are actually the building companies that pay you a premium. Is there a conflict there? Well, firstly, we're not a membership organisation. We don't have any members. The builders apply to become registered with NHBC and we decide whether or not they will be registered with us. And OK, let me rephrase that, Mr McLeod. So, is there a conflict of interest at no. all with the fact that the builders who are registered with NHBC, so they are the only ones who can get your inspections, who can get your 10-year guarantee, because MD who's not registered with you cannot have that and do not have those inspections. So is there any conflict with the fact that the builders who are registered with you and therefore paying the premiums to you are the ones that you give your guarantees to? No, because okay. we, are not, we are not the only organisation that provides this sort of service. We have provided, we are the leading warranty and insurance organisation in the UK for the new home building sector. And our systems have been developed since 1936, and we think are very robust and are the best uh, on offer. But there are other organisations that provide similar, but not the same type of service. So the builders do not have to come to NHBC um, to obtain a warranty. Uh, it's, a it's, a, you know, it's a voluntary thing. The builders can apply to NHBC to become registered with us. But Mr McLeod, I know that, and we've, we've established that, but the only builders that you'll give your 10-year guarantee to are the ones that are registered with you. That's correct, because yeah. okay. we have vetted Thanks. them, we've right. checked them, and as part of the registration process, they're contracted to carry out the building work in accordance with their building standards and facility of inspections on site, and are also bound by our claims process. So we have contractually tied them down. So if they're not registered with us, we don't have that contractual agreement in place. Okay, thank you, Mr McLeod. It's worth noting that uh, Mr McLeod doesn't personally go out and do the... Do, do do the checks as NHBC? So well, we'll try, I, yes. I, I, do you do the checks personally, Mr McLeod? I, I don't do these personally, but I'm heavily involved in what we call a Prime the Job competition, which is there to encourage builders to uh, improve standards. And uh, I spent yesterday, all day yesterday, going around building sites, uh, assessing construction for that very okay. purpose. The, there you go. Um, Mr Simpson. Uh, convener, I'm, I'm aware that uh, Mr Whiteman has been itching to get in, so I'm happy to give way to him and I'll come back in later. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, he has been itching to get in, as has Mr Scott, I have to say as well. So we'll, we'll take them in that order and then yeah. we'll take you back in. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the evidence we've been seeking has primarily been about who should do the verification, and we've heard conflicting reports on that. Um, I'm just wondering, what much of the evidence from Homes for Scotland and HBC refers to delays in the process? Indeed, um, uh, the evidence of, I think it's NHBC, talks about in reality the current delays inherent in the system are encouraging builders to start work without the proper building control consents in place. In addition to this being illegal, it raises questions how compliance can be demonstrated or checked. 
Um, if the private sector or if others were to take on this verification process, is speed the only thing you'd be looking for? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, speed is certainly not the only thing. Uh, where we do this in England, where we've been doing it since the, the, the 1980s, it's about um, providing an efficient service, but at the same time ensuring that service is correctly delivered. So it's not about speed, it's about ensuring a proper service is delivered, and at the end of the day, providing consumer redress if it's not properly delivered. In England and Wales, where we deliver the service, we provide an insurance, separate insurance protection, so that if the building control element of that is of that service is not delivered properly, and there's a building control issue at the end of the day, the end user, the homeowner, can make a claim against that insurance separate from the warranty that covers the, the latent defects within the build. So, uh, Paul, you, you finished, no, no, Mr McLeod. No, no. I thought Mr Kent wanted to add something, and Nick will take it after that. No, no, I just thought you were looking at me there momentarily. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think the... You know, there's a big aspect from the Federation membership across the country, and not all of them in their respective areas, as I said, do have different views, but... I do think that or we, we would suggest that we, we would need to see a, or there is a need to see an improvement in service generally and speed is a big factor um, and also uh, having a resolution service there like the NHBC provide is a big assistance. And just on that um, building warrants that you provide. Well, Barclay wants to, to, to add something then we'll take you back in. Um, just agreeing with what the gentleman said just then. Speed is one of the main issues for us and the uncertainty of how long it will take you to get a building warrant. Um, you know, in some parts of the country, absolutely. Um, Orkney, not a problem. Edinburgh, we have a disaster at the moment. Um, we've got developers waiting more than 42 weeks to get a building warrant. That's after they've had to go through the pain of getting a planning consent and they've still got to get a roads construction consent as well. A real lack of certainty about how long it'll take between doing a deal on a piece of land and actually getting on site and that isn't good for anybody's business plan and that's what we're looking for is certainty of delivery um, and I, I know that the gentleman from labs couldn't give us numbers of um, building inspectors within local councils but the anecdotal feedback I've had from our members is that they have been severely reduced over the last few years and it's really put a massive pressure on the service just do not have the resources to deal with the number of applications coming in at a time when the market is improving and there are more applications being submitted and there's a real drive for more houses to be built. We don't have the facilities within local authorities to deal with all the regulatory um, consents that need to be approved before you can start on site. Okay, thank you. A brief supplementary to Mr McLeod before I move on. You talk about your building warrant service in England and how you provide an insurance policy to owners separate from your warrant service. How, how long... Can that is that can homeowners claim on that? It's ten years. It's the same. Ten years. Cover in terms so, of the building mark. So, so moving on, it, it, it seems that one of the issues here is that there are a number of people involved in this market. There are the, the speculative volume house building industry. There's uh, building companies. Uh, there's local authorities who are doing inspections and providing building warrants and com um, checking completion certificates. But at the end of the day, someone is paying a substantial sum of money to buy a house and that once defects are discovered, it does not appear that in some critical instances that re proper redress is available. Now, Mr Aitken said that basically that is a civil matter for the legal system. Um, should that be the case? Because you're talking about uh, 10 years after your warranty expires, is that correct? Our, our warranty lasts for 10 years. 10 years. Um, is it not the case that if you you know buy a pair of shoes, you'd expect them to wear out after two, three, four years? You don't expect a house to wear out after 10 years. Should a warranty not last for the design life of the building? Well, it can, but the problem with that will be cost. I mean, like all these things, the, the longer you look for something to, to be in place, the, the, the higher the cost will be. But that I would mean, drive the, up the, the standards, surely? It would... Yeah, I think um, yeah. the, the, at the moment it's set at 10 years. Now that's set by, a, as I said, in, although I've said there are other organisations that provide a similar service across the UK, NHPC is the only uh, insurance company that directly underwrites that risk. All the other companies that provide that service are brokers, so they offload the risk to an insurance broker and it's a third party, some who are based offshore, who, who insure that. Um, we, it, we insure it 
It, directly, uh, and that insurance is calculated and has to satisfy the criteria set down by the financial regulator in terms of assessing the risk and in terms of ensuring that there's sufficient uh, reserves put aside to address that risk. So it's, it's, you know, if you've got something for 10 years and you want to extend it for, say, 60 years, then mathematically it's going to cost more. You're going to have to set aside more reserves. The risk will increase, so the cost of the policy and the premium will increase. At the moment, the average cost over 10 years is roughly about £500, which is, I think, relatively good value for a 10-year cover. Um, I couldn't tell you what the cost would be if it was increased to 60 years, but it would be significant. Uh, and it could okay. possibly be un you know, uncompetitive and not, you know. And you, you mentioned also in earlier evidence that one of your objectives is to, is to drive up standards Correct. in the building industry. Uh, I'm just looking at your latest annual report where the, um, the bonuses for your executives are calculated on the basis of a number of criteria. 40% is calculated on financial criteria. 20% mm -hmm. is homeowner and builder customer satisfaction. Correct. Yep. Of that 20%, how much is homeowner satisfaction and how much is, or a homeowner and builder customer the same? No, they're, they're both different. Uh, um, I'll start by saying I don't know what percentage is applied in terms of homeowner and, and builder. I would imagine it would be 50% each way, but I don't know um, for the record. The homeowner and builder satisfaction are two different surveys uh, we carry out. Uh, we carry out uh, a customer satisfaction survey on behalf of the Home Builders Federation in England and Wales. Uh, that survey also extends into Scotland and is an independent survey from the building industry as such and directly re, uh, directly communicates and receives information from homeowners. Now that has been carried out since I think 2004 and that is one of the surveys that is referred to in terms of customer satisfaction, that's homeowners. The other is another independent survey that we carry out with the building industry, the house builders, to find out what they think about NGPC and the service that they get from us in that you know, building control, or in warranty, inspection, the whole range of services that we offer. So there are the two different services. Okay, uh, so it looks... And the other part of the, the, of the bonus that refers to, to money, it's operational costs. If we're not making an operational profit, uh, which is different from the insurance side of the business, then the bonus is null and void. Um, but if operationally the organisation is in profit, then there will be a bonus. Okay, so the, the, the leadership from the top in terms of their bonuses, and they're very, very attractive, yeah, um, it's public information. We don't we don't hide that. It's no, no, an I know. But, but to confirm that ten percent of the criteria is homeowner satisfaction, it appears. Yeah. Mm. Um, finally, before I'm, I'm aware time's pressing, um, we've heard that NHBC and some of its clients who take insurance with it uh, use gagging orders to stop homeowners talking about defects that have been found in settlements that have been reached. Is that common practice? No, um, and I think that that's probably the incorrect term. I mean, I think what happened, um, and I'm not party to it, but I believe that um, the case that was referred to uh, was a cash settlement, i.e. that the, there was an agreement met between the homeowner uh, and the HPC in relation to a, a sum of money okay. to satisfy them in terms of their loss. And as part of that agreement uh, written into it, as like a standard clause was that it would be kept confidential. Okay. Thank you. Apologies that... Just, just for clarity, because we are in a public session, now, Mr. Whiteman. Just, just for clarity, that was the expression that was used when we got that information, mm. ra rather than the, the expression you used. But I, I understand why you would, why you would phrase it that way, Mr. Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Davis, convener. Um, I'm here um, to represent my constituents in air with the case that Mr. McLeod will be very familiar with, and with their permission to discuss the problems facing Dalblair Court in air. Uh, Dalblair Court is the home of six, its 69 properties and there have been faults with this property um, for all the time that I've been elected to represent this constituency, which have been drawn to my attention. There's been a great deal of correspondence between yourself and me in this regard. Uh, this property is now being entirely re-roofed at a cost to the residents, depending on the size of their property, at some four to seven thousand pounds per property. Uh, to replace a roof that has, as it is now being taken to bits to be repla repaired, is allegedly uh, utterly defective in, in, in many respects. Um, this was signed off by uh, 
South Ayrshire Council uh, as the local authority concerned, and and I have been in. The, there is the, the situation where the local authorities say that it was built to the specification at the time required, and NHBC have also said that. The bottom line is my constituents are left with this problem, um, and to be frank, sir. Mr. McLeod, you've washed your hands of it. Um, now, I'm not certain what value you have, your organisation has been in this process at all, because I understood that they did, they were covered by the build mark policy, um, and this roof is not yet 15 years old, yet it's having to be replaced because it wasn't built to specification. Um, this apparently escaped you, and and has apparently escaped South Ayrshire Council too. And I am extraordinarily annoyed on behalf of my constituents who are now facing this bill. So given that these defects are being covered, um, uncovered as they deconstruct the roof to essentially rebuild it to the specification that was originally expected, will your policy now cover their costs of this rebuild? Come in here first, Mr. McLeod. Um, we were hoping that, and I know it's frustrating for some of the constituents who will be keen to hear their stories reflected in a public session of, of this committee, but what we can't do as a committee, and we had kind of spoken about it previously, is rehearse individual cases because there, there may be some, some issues in, in relation to that potential litigation and various other matters. I'm not referring to the case you raised, Mr. Scott, but there might be a slight restriction in what Mr. McLeod or, or others could say. But there is a wider point in Mr. Scott's question about where something, when something apparently has just not been built to specification eh, and there's consequences from that where the recourse actually sits for, for the homeowners. Um, I'm not trying to be helpful to you, Mr. McLeod. I'm trying to just couch the, the, the rules of engagement when, when you seek to reply to that. So with that in mind, any response you could give would be helpful. But the wider issue, of course, is you, you, something gets signed off saying it should be built a certain way. It's just not done. That becomes self-evident and no one seems to be taking responsibility. And from what we can gather, not just Mr Scott's constituency case, but in a variety of cases we've heard, that seems to be how it is for a lot of people. So, not just Mr McLeod, but others may want to come in if they've got any reflections on that, Mr McLeod. Uh, well, firstly, can I say to Mr Scott, I don't, I don't have the details with me, but I'm very happy to meet with you with the, the committee hearing and discuss the particular issue and to see if we can assist in any way. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll follow up on that matter. I would be grateful for that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the wider question, then um, I, I, I can't agree that there's no protection because NHPC is volunteers for 10 years. Uh, in certain circumstances with the housing associations that can be extended to 12 years. The majority of um, defects, serious defects, we find tend to occur within years seven to eight of the build. That's when we tend to get the majority of them. I'm not saying others don't happen out with that time frame, um, but it does suggest in terms of our research and information that the 10 year life of the, of the insurance cover is about right. Um, I would also say that uh, you know other organisations in the marketplace that offer a similar service have got the exact same time constraints in terms of their cover and their policy. Uh, where we get involved, I can only reiterate what we do uh, in terms of assessing any complaint that we receive against the policy. We will investigate. If it meets the terms of that policy, we will address it with the builder, if, if that is possible. If not, we will take on that responsibility. And there is a right of recourse through the financial ombudsman if, there's, if it's felt that we have not managed that process properly. So can, we, can we just expand this? Because Mr. Aiken might have a, a, view in, a view in relation to this. I'm not trying to curtail you, but I think it's reasonable at this point to, to, to make the obvious assertion that if, you, if you're a homeowner and something's not been built based on what the planning permission said it would be, but it's been through all the processes, the NHBC outline, and it, it's been verified and signed off, and you get something different, you have, you might, have, you you almost certainly won't have a recourse in many circumstances under the policy of NHBC. Does the local authority <coughs> have any powers to go back to the developer and go, well, we gave you permission to build X, but you built Y or Z, um, and and that's not on. Um, 
what can local authorities do in those circumstances? Well, currently, I think I mentioned previously, it's, it's, it's the builder that actually should be building as per the approved plans. And obviously what's happened in this, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the case, but what uh, potentially has happened, that that's, the builder has not built in accordance with the approved plans. Now, a lot of that, that um, the elements of the build, with the time building standards um, carry out their inspections may be covered up and they don't get uh, um, sight of uh, particular elements that are exposed at the time. So they're going on the trust of the builder to sign off the completion of the developer that everything has been built in accordance with the approved plans. Mr Gilmore, <coughs> we'll take in, uh, just a brief, I'll take in a little second, but ju just surely, Mr Aiken, if, if something's not been built to the approved plans, there should be financial consequences to the developer. And, and, and legal recourse, separate from what an insurance policy yeah. says, for the homeowner. Well, I think that's what I said earlier, it'll be a civil matter then, as far as the Building Scotland Act is concerned. I, I, that's as things stand just now, Mr uh, yeah. Aiken, but perhaps things may have to change, Mr Gilmore. Yeah, <clears throat> I understood that if it was a latent defect in Scots law, you're liable for that for life. And I put it back to like a gas, a gas explosion in Edinburgh, where the, someone had fitted a valve wrong and went through the whole judicial process. My view would be, I think you should maybe check that, uh, that, that, that that information I'm giving you is correct. But a latent defect is really the manufacturer printed instruction for a, a lap of a tile, say 75 millimetres. And the idea of that is to cover the nail or the nail holes of the previous tile. And if it, what you get is what we call it shortened cover, right? And if it's shortened cover, a lot of the leaks come from the nails because you've got a bit of capillary attraction. That's why it's as big as three inches and all money are 75 mil. And I don't know the case, but it's just, I've always been under impression. We built houses, we do the whole lot. We do small to medium enterprise as well. And I've always been of the opinion that a latent defect is for life. Okay. okay. Is that helpful? That, 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 that's very helpful. Um, do you want to follow up, Mr Scott? My apologies for cutting you off on your flow there. Do you want to follow up some of that and then I'll take no, Mr Simpson in? I would welcome a meeting with Mr McLeod in this regard. And I note what Mr Aiken has said and that if there is no insurance in these circumstances, these particular circumstances, which I apologise to the committee for taking up their time with, but notwithstanding, if there is no NHBC cover, notwithstanding the alleged obvious defects, then the only recourse for my constituents would be in law. And I w welcome your contribution there, uh, sir, Mr Gilmer, for saying that a latent defect should be liable for life. I think that would be very helpful. But I would have also thought that that would have encouraged, particularly in these circumstances, NHBC to become the person carrying that liability. Or the builder to return. Indeed. Absolutely. Indeed. Well, which they would exists, recover from the, the builder. Absolutely. Indeed. Point taken. Thank you. That's it. OK, Mr Simpson. Thanks, convener. Um, so we've heard uh, about uh, perceived flaws in the building regulation system. Uh, we've heard that the, the, the whole development industry appears to run its own scheme, uh, does run its own scheme uh, of, uh, sort of warranties. Where is the statutory redress for home buyers if things go wrong? Any of you? Mr Gilmore, you've helped me out there. That, that'll buy the worst time to have a Thank think you, about Chair. that, Mr Gilmore. Uh, what I'll say, under the FMB's compliance, we now have a system where the pe we have a contract with the clients rather than just in the small to medium enterprise world where there's a lot of, I've used the word cowboys floating about in that industry uh, and they've not got the proper insurance and even if they have the proper insurance, they're not carrying out the proper job. What would happen is an arbitration system and that's it, and it's totally independent. And when someone's got a complaint, it goes through the complaints process and totally fully investigated. And if both parties are not satisfied, we then are given the opportunity to sign up to arbitration. And that gives them the form of redress because when they sign that document, they have to accept the arbiter's outcome. So I think that's something that could be knocked on at the back end. We, we've always started this in the last three and a half years. And it's, it's actually working very well. We're getting less complaints because it's getting, it's getting resolved at source. Is that helpful? Is that Your company, Mr Gilmore, no, no, is that it's across the entire sector? Federation of Master Builders right. for the UK. OK. 
okay. That's that's rolled out everywhere, and they sign a contract uh, prior to starting the, the process, and it's also get plain English speaking on the contract, so it's no <laughs> section three hundred and twenty-seven in the small print. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? That Nicola Barclay, then Malcolm Cloud. Um, for the larger and volume builders, and anybody who's registered with NHBC or two of the other main warranty providers across the country will have to sign up to the consumer code for home builders which is a similar service it provides consumers with all the necessary information that they would require right the way through the buying process and then once they've moved into their home they know exactly who they need to contact um, you know once they, they've moved in if they have any issues they also have a dispute resolution service and so if people don't feel as though they've had the answer they want from either the builder or the warranty provider, they can go to an independent um, adjudicator. Um, I actually sit on the board of the Consumer Code and we go through the adjudication decisions and have a look very carefully and we scrutinise them to see whether they're systemic failures or whether they're one-off issues which couldn't have been foreseen and we'll go back to the builder and work with them to make sure that they um, you know, improve their practices in the future. Okay, thank you. Mr McLeod? Uh, I was really going to refer to the consumer code as well, convener. Uh, in addition to lining that, there is a there is the ten year warranty there from HPC. So, I mean, we can't speak for statutory control or regulation, but uh, as an insurance product, it does provide comprehensive protection. Mr. Kemp, I would just add. I mean, the, the federation agrees that um, you know there is protection. There is protection there in the form of NHPC, etc. Right now, and maybe going a step back, the key perhaps is looking at the. Uh, inspection process and um, you know I know from experience the NHBC uh, inspector or, or other warranty providers inspectors when they're on site so regularly um, there is perhaps a school of thought that if they were positioned to carry out the verification and those inspections as well um, then it would become much more robust uh, rather than in some cases where there's a very irregular uh, visit from building standards also Okay, thank you. Mr. Sims, would you follow up on some of that? Yeah. Um, so bo both these things, Mr. Gilmore, your, your, your system, and uh, Nicola Barclay, your code, um, they, all, they all come from you. There is actually no statutory system of redress for anyone. We're thinking it's probably the biggest, a house is the biggest thing you'll ever buy. Uh, the most amount of money most of us will ever spend uh, and yet, uh, we appear to have uh, fewer consumer rights than we would if we bought a washing machine. Um, and that seems to me to be a, a completely ridiculous situation. Um, one idea that I've heard of, uh, and it merges um, from the All Parliamentary Group for Excellence in the Built Environment um, uh, in Westminster, was that uh, we should have a new homes ombudsman and that could be uh, a way of providing redress for people when things go wrong and I accept that when things go wrong is is rare but you know, we've we've heard a, a snapshot today uh, of some very very serious cases <coughs> my guess is that'll be the tip of the iceberg what, what would you think to that sort of idea there's a suggestion uh, mr. McLeod uh, I mean, I've got no real comments to make, either good or bad, for it. Because, you know, as, as always, you would need the detail to see to see what it really what it looked look like in reality. But we are already governed. The NHPC certainly, because we're an insurance company, is governed by an ombudsman. Uh, so we have the financial ombudsman sitting overlooking us, and that is the right of redress that the policyholders certainly have if they feel that we are not responding to their demands or meeting their concerns. So we are already interact with and work with the Ombudsman um, where we have to. So that was open-minded, Mr McLeod, in relation to Mr Simpson's... Well, I'd, I'd like to, you know, I mean, the detail. I mean, I, I, I'm, I would be confused about how two Ombudsmen work together. We're already governed uh, under the, uh, you know, the financial regu regulations by an, by an independent Ombudsman service. Our activities yeah. are... Specific to your... Policy. Well, specific to any insurance company or yeah. bank, uh, we yeah. are governed by the financial regulations. Of course, we're not, in, we're not inquiring about, my apologies, Mr. we're not inquiring about insurance policies here today, we're inquiring about building standards in new build properties and that yeah. construction process. Uh, your policy can change based on what you want to negotiate with uh, the companies who, 
who, who pay insurance premiums to yourself. But, mm, I, no. but I think Mr. Simpson's suggestion was something far more cross-cutting. They want to say a little bit more about that, Mr. Simpson, before I bring in other witnesses. Yeah, um, it's, it's completely different. You're, you're talking about a you know, financial regulation. I'm talking about uh, something that would deal uh, with uh, uh, disputes that arise from people buying new homes. It's not, it's not a financial thing. It's when things go wrong with that new home. At the moment, people don't have anywhere to turn. It, it sounds similar. I mean, the dispute that they would have is whether or not we've handled their complaint properly in terms of whatever defect they've brought to our attention. I'm not specific. That's, that's sorry, I'm not specifically that. talking about NHBC. Okay. It, it's in general. That's, that's helpful. I thought that actually was quite helpful, so we were clear about what yeah. Mr. Simpson was suggesting, Nicola Barclay. Um, on the APPG that Graham Simpson, sorry, Mr. Simpson, um, referred to just then, um, we should make it quite clear that the Consumer Code, um, Consumer Code Board was not approached by the parliamentary group to give evidence on that, although they requested to a number of times. So there are some um, findings within that report that we have been going back and forward with Westminster on to try to seek clarity and have laid down some further information in the library at Westminster, if you care to look at that. Um, before this evidence session, I specifically asked the chair of the Consumer Code for a bit more clarification for my own mind, I'm, I'm fairly new to sitting on the board, what happens to a consumer if they don't, uh, if they're not happy with their redress from the house builder, if they're not happy with the outcome for the warranty provider, they've gone through the dispute resolution process within the code and have gone to adjudication, have been found, um, you know, uh, maybe not happy with the, the result of that, what their next steps would be. And, and I was advised it's the financial ombudsman service is the next course of redress and also consumer protection um, they're covered by the Property Misdescription Act, and which is enforced through trading standards. And then beyond that, it's civil court. So that is the, that's the route that people can go down. OK, any other comments? That Mr Aiken, did you want to come in? Just uh, labs refers to that, uh, that option that's available uh, within our paper, but the, the Ombudsman, the report from down south. So. OK, thank you. Anyone else want to add in, in, in relation to that? Uh, I'll take you back in, in, in a second, Mr Scott, but I was just going to make the observation that in replies to that, we had the Consumer Code. We've heard very helpful from Mr Gilmore about the Federation of Master Builders across the UK and what they do, the Financial Ombudsman, NHBC's policies, other warranty uh, insurance companies' policies, trading standards and the civil courts. It does seem quite fragmented and bitsy a little bit. Could I mean, Whether you would support it or not, could you see merit in a consolidation of all these various threads together in relation to what Mr Simpson's suggesting. I'm just wondering if that would be helpful, that all the recourse sits in the one place rather than property owners having to scurry about to find out where, where they have to go to get a redress and perhaps not getting it. Any thoughts on that? No thoughts on that. OK. Uh, Mr. Mr Scott, of course. Could I ask Mr Aiken, who will keep me right in this regard, but... I have the feeling that um, trading standards are unable to, certainly in South Ayrshire, take up a complaint uh, such as the one I mentioned at Dalblair Court because they would have a conflict of interest in as much as they are employed by the local authority yeah. um, to do, and therefore they wouldn't be able to investigate a complaint made against. Yeah, I don't think I'm in a position to speak for trading standards. I'm here representing LABS, Local Authority Building Standards, so it's different organisations. Okay, well then, in which case, can I just say that I think when I have raised this with my local trading standards office, the case I specifically cite, that they were unable because of a perceived conflict of interest, I believe, to take up the case because it was with another part of the same local authority. And that is now in the public record. Elaine Smith. Thanks, <coughs> convener. Um, Mr Aiken, could I just explore an issue with yourself, please? Um, I was quite interested in this whole issue about um, Clark Works and building companies perhaps not employing them the way they used to in the past. So that was something that I found rather unusual. Um, and then if we look at NHBC and th the role that they're carrying out, what they're doing is carrying out 
an inspection role for the companies who buy into their policy. And the advantage to the companies of doing that is because they then can put up signs saying NHBC 10-year guarantee, which I think gives some comfort to the people purchasing the houses who may also have an idea that national house building somehow means a more formal government type uh, assurance. So that, you know, that might be a perception. So we've, we've got that going on. So what I want to ask is, um, do you think we actually need more building control officers to carry out um, an inspection regime which is impartial rather than partial? And also, would we, should we be looking as a committee maybe at things like um, the statute that's involved to look at more um, recourse for the customer in statute? And that all adds in then to the possibility of increased fees. Would it be that those increased fees not only should be, and I look at the Federation Master Builders saying that if the fee is going to increase, then service should increase as well, but should that not just be for the... Uh, the, the builders who obviously want a quicker system to get building, but also for the customers who should be able, surely, to rely on a much more impartial inspection regime. Uh, Mr Bacon, just, just before you answer yeah. that, I'm conscious you mentioned fees. We could talk about this another hour probably now that you've mentioned yeah. the prospect of fees. But Mr McLeod, I think it's only reasonable <laughs> once Mr Bacon answers that if you want to come back in relation to the impartiality of the inspection process, because that was mentioned by the Deputy Convener. Uh, Mr Aiken? Yeah, I'll just pick up on a few a few of the issues there. Um, we need to keep me right, because there was quite a, a number of things I think you wanted answered there. Um, in terms of the inspections, uh, obviously any additional inspections would be would be welcome by, by industry. But I, I think I mentioned previously, we've got to look at building standards. It's certainly um, my view and Labs' view that we've got to look at building standards holistically has to be looked at holistically. Building standards services in Scotland are just a, a small piece of the, a small but vital piece of the, of the jigsaw. Um, and I think it has to be opened out to the, uh, the, the wider industry. We need to look at uh, procurement. We do have to look at the, the, the current um, uh, statutory legal system, the way, it, the way it's set up. And if, uh, if industry can come together collectively, then I'm sure we could uh, reduce a lot of these, the, these issues that have been discussed today in terms of uh, defects. But would it be beneficial to the purchasers, for example, to have more building control inspectors actually going out and looking more closely? The way NHBC um, say that Mr McLeod has said that NHBC do for the properties and the builders that are involved with them. Mr McLeod said earlier that they go out and they have the field officers and they do actual inspections. Yeah. Would it be beneficial for... Um, people in Scotland who are making the biggest purchase perhaps of their lives, as Graeme Simpson made, said, to have some kind of uh, confidence that there's, and I'm calling it impartial, that an impartial service such as building control would be doing far more inspections than currently they do. Yeah, I mean, like I said, any additional inspection uh, would be welcome, but you would have to change the, the, the current uh, legal system, the way it's set up just now, to allow that to, to happen. But I suppose that's mm. what I'm asking. Right. Should we be looking at statutes? Should we be looking at well, the, the building regulations? Yeah. Should we be looking at the, the, the legal system so to see whether or not it needs changed? I, I, my view is, and I think Labs' view is, we'd have to look at it holistically, yes. OK, thank you. I don't feel obliged to come back in, but I thought you have wanted to come back in. I, I, yeah, I would just want to stress that NHPC is an independent organisation and uh, the inspections we carry out are impartial. Last year we carried out about 800,000 inspections across the UK. I think we identified potentially about half a million um, defects arising from these inspections. Uh, we then give the building, op building companies the opportunity to rectify them and if they don't then again we will take control of that situation. Could I just ask on that, your impartiality only applies to the building companies that buy your insurance, not the building companies that don't. The, you don't well, inspect them. We, we don't inspect them because we have no contractual relationship yep. with them. Okay. The ones that we inspect, they're contractually tied to NHPC, so if our inspectors find something wrong on site, they have to sort that out. Otherwise, we have the authority to, to go in and sort it out on their behalf. We don't have that relationship with builders who are not registered with us. We have no contractual agreement with them. Perhaps just one, one final question, because there's one aspect we haven't really explored very much today, and we heard it in our private session previously, and that's where... Um, you effectively maybe end up with a, a neighbourhood dispute where someone wants to build a, an extension to the property. And I won't get into the details of the case, 
um, and it becomes self-evident that local authority very hires would appear to have signed off on 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 the extension that isn't actually the same as the as the outline plan said that were approved and that it isn't doesn't meet the specs. So the same and, and as we've heard earlier on uh, in relation to large scale developments, and when that's drawn to the attention of local authorities, it's all anecdotal evidence, of course, Mr. Hagen. Uh, that the local authority in this case said it's not really a material difference, even though it's making a significant detrimental impact on the neighbouring property. And the person we heard from made the point, well, surely the self-evident situation is you were given planning approval for one thing, you've built something else, it's been verified, we've identified that they've built something else, it's impacting our quality of life, and a local authority doesn't act, and they don't feel they've got any recourse either. So I think it's reasonable to outline that, because we heard that this morning also. So any reflections on that, Mr Aiken, would be welcome. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned planning at the same time, the different consents yeah. there. Um, so I'd like to know a bit more about the actual dispute. Is it a planning matter or is it a, a building warrant matter? Well, I, I think I would have to say, is it not? Well, actually, c can I answer that with a question? <laughs> which would be when a local authority verifier signs off on a property yeah. as, as the extension would complete, for example, and that property owner self-verifies saying, yes, that, that, we've done that accordingly, and there's a complete mismatch in relation to that, and a neighbour to their detriment discovers that, and they go back to the local authority, if everyone's still following here, mm -hmm. whose job is it to give that individual recourse who's their property has been impacted by this and there was never, never planning approval for it and surely a local authority verifier at the very least should make sure that um, when they verify something it actually is in accordance with what the plans were in the first place. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know the, the specific case but typically what would happen is the verifier would uh, go on site, carry out the checks and an amendment to warrant would be required for any deviations from the initial approvals. Okay. <laughs> I think that, yeah. that that's helpful yeah. if, if that's the process as yeah. it is. Um, if there's any additional comments, we're all out of questions here. If there's any additional comments any of our witnesses want to make, n now would be an opportunity, Mr Kemp. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I'm glad we're kind of moving on to the, the issue of inspection rather than concentrating on redress because at the end of the day, um, the inspection's what's failed and re that's what results in defects where they go unnoticed. And uh, certainly, I mean, I, I can I can speak from both. I've worked in Edinburgh building houses. I'm working in Orkney building houses, and where you've got a, a well-staffed or well-resourced uh, building standards department who do generally come out regularly. They build up a working relationship with the site managers. They see the building at various stages. That does have a very positive effect. Um, where, and I was amazed to see some of the statistics where there's a very very rare. Uh, inspection or you know where a builder can build x number of houses and barely expect to be inspected you know more than once or twice it amazed me um certainly when i worked down here the, the sort of rarity of seeing the building standards inspector was a new thing for me coming from orkney and uh, we were wholly reliant on the nhbc's inspection uh, regime there and and i would just I, I suppose say as well that builders do especially site managers do work very hard to rectify and remedy uh, our eyes on the building site um, but it's. I think we're coming back to the, the builders who aren't registered often and where there is no remedy for the householder. I think we could cut down instances of defect an awful lot by saying better, better resource uh, building standard inspections. Okay, anyone you know, else want to make a point before we, we close the evidence session? Nicola Barclay. I just want to make one final comment as well that we shouldn't forget that this is all relating back to the lack of skills and resources within the entire construction industry. Um, not only do we have a lack of building control officers, um, it's also making sure that we've got people coming through the system who've been well trained by our colleges, apprenticeship programmes. It's a much wider issue than just building standards. Okay, thank you for putting that on the record, Mr McLeod. I think just to, to, to conclude, uh, I want to make the point, NHPC is uh, not structured to be non-profit distributing. We have no shareholders, we don't pay any dividends. And our core purpose, as I've already said, is to raise house building standards and to protect the, the end users, the consumers. And we believe that by providing a building control service, as we have done and do in England, we can enhance that core purpose. 
because by checking plans, by becoming more involved on site and carrying out more inspections on site, we can improve that construction process and deliver you know, better quality homes at the end of the day. Does Mr Aiken or Mr Gilmer want to add anything before we close? Uh, just can, I, can I just conclude? Uh, I think it would be uh, Labs' view, certainly on the impartiality uh, issue that was asked in the, the, the paper, um, that local authority building standards are, are well placed. They are impartial um, and accountable to the, to the local uh, electorate. Uh, I think NHBC would struggle, given uh, what Malcolm's already um, explained in terms of the, the organisation, the way it's set up. Impartiality, they would struggle there, given their connection with the builders. Okay, uh, Mr. you've already put on the record your views on impartiality. If you feel yeah. need to re repeat it, Mr. McLeod, I'll let you repeat it, but you've put it on the record already. No, I'd just like to re reiterate that view, and would also like to refer to the Scottish Government's research supporting the appoint appointment of verifiers, which was published in 2010, which actually refers to the private sector building control improving the efficiency of the service and leading to more innovation in that service. So it's recognised you know, in Scottish Government publications that we can help. You've now put that on the record. Uh, Mr Gilmore. Go back to supervision. That's where it all starts. If a site's not been supervised properly, I don't. The, the, doing visits is all you can do. You can't have a full-time NHBC person sitting on a, a site all day. And what happens in a very simple process, when you get a site, which well, let's call it a field, you've got to shape it. So you shape it, and basically what you're doing is scraping it and setting it out. You then cut the founds. And you can cut the founds and pour the founds. There's a stage there where NHBC will come in and check those founds before they're backfilled. Exact same with drainage. So it's a step process where they don't have to be there every day watching the joiner cutting wood, but they do come in a step. I think, quite honestly, the skills gap is really hitting everybody at the moment. Uh, I was on the board for UK as well for CITB for quite a while, and we've seen quite a dip in the proper training, not just the training. And down in London, they're wishing to cut, I'm sorry, this is important, they're wishing to cut apprenticeships to two years, right? Now, I, my question to them in London was, if you're a £20,000 kitchen, would you let a young two-year apprentice loose with all your marble worktops and all your kitchen units? And the answer, 100%, is no. And we should not be letting the kids down by reducing the term that they have to serve on an apprenticeship. It may suit the big boys, I don't think in Scotland, but it may suit the big boys for a bricky to lay a line of brick. That's what it's called. But can you send him out to do an arts? Can you send him out to do anything? Off a decent drawing, the boy would be lost. And if, if he came to your company, I'd be surprised if he was with us after two weeks. We would ha we'd have had him removed because he's not got the ability. Thank you. Can I say thank you very much for that? And we are taking on board all the points, whether that was our line of question or not. We're taking on board the points you raised. We'll have to decide as a committee how we want to kind of follow up on this. I think it's also reasonable to say, as a committee, as, well, as all MSPs know, we only really ever hear about things when they go wrong. That's the nature of the jobs that we do. Um, so we have no idea the extent of problems and issues that exist, but we do know it's our job to respond to them when we hear about them. But we also know the solution is everyone around this table working in partnership whether the system changes or not, but we are keen to continue with this line of scrutiny to see if the system does have to change and if more safeguards can be put into the system. So can I thank everyone here this now this afternoon for what has been a lengthy evidence session, but also put on record my thanks for the constituents who were in private session with us earlier on to give what they perceive to have been their significant problems with the way the system is currently designed. So thank you, everyone, and we'll stay in contact with you over the progress of our of our scrutiny in this area and I suspend briefly before we move to the next agenda item. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. I'm going to move to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation. The committee will consider negative instrument SSI 2017 forward slash 102 as listed on the agenda. This instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul the instrument. I uh, can inform members that no motion to annul has been laid. Can I invite members if they've got any particular comments to make on the instrument? Okay, uh, bear with me one second. Okay, that's fine. No comments on that instrument? No. Okay. Can I therefore uh, invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Are we agreed? Yes. Okay. Can I thank members for that? And can I move the session into private session and ask for members of the public gallery to leave the committee room? We now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>